Okay, so this is something new. You uh, won't find me on the internet in video form um, very often. I'm not a fan of it, but I have a new trilogy come out next year and I thought I should bite the bullet and join the video age. Um, so I have invested in a microphone um, and watched some tutorials. I'm not a fan of video or audio, to be honest. I have uh, my best friend um, harasses me to talk to him on the phone um, on a regular basis. And 10 years have passed and I haven't done it. So um, consider yourself honored. But when you've got all this going on, it's, it's a shame to hide it from the world. I thought I would start with um, revisiting um, this set of critiques that I did on page ones that people were invited to send in so that I could critique them. Um, and I did a few years back. Um, one of the good things with uh, writing is that it ages very slowly, so um, we can still watch, uh, we can still get some, some good from looking at these things. Um, this uh, is on my blog so you can go and look it up on my blog if you want we start with a great number of disclaimers because um critiquing people's writing is a, a very sensitive area and um not only can the person themselves um take offense from the process even though they volunteered for it uh, i hesitate to say that none of the people involved here did but people on the internet looking to take offense about something can take offense on their behalf and uh that was indeed what stopped this process after about eight pages. It just became not worth the hassle. Um, but it's um, an interesting thing to look at maybe for this first venture into YouTube videos, um, where I hope to grow my massive following from 80 something to uh, dizzy heights, let's say. So uh, the process was that everyone who wanted to, and there were hundreds, though I only did about eight of them, um, would send in their first page of their work in progress, and um, I would um, dissect it as minutely as, as I felt like, um, giving my opinions. And that's what those disclaimers we just scrolled past were all about, just uh, a reminder that these are merely opinions and can be discarded at will if they are not helpful um and that it takes effort to do uh with the sole intention of being helpful if i wanted to insult people i could find much more efficient ways of doing that um i wouldn't put a whole bunch of effort in like i have here it's um intended to help the person who asked me to help them um so maybe we can read the first page and then go through my thoughts on it so this is, uh, let's go back, um, a book called With Great Power by Terry Jones. I don't know if it was ever published or if this was just something that they started. Um, chapter one, Denny drifted awake so slowly and with so little sensation that he might have been floating in space, warm, calm space. It was easy to push away the anxious childhood dream to replace that with a ship, sleeping quarters, all his intentional family near him in the dark. Somewhere near was Karen, curled like her black hair. Everyone curled because that's what bodies do, sleeping in zero G. Banky Aaron would not be far away. Ship's doctor, blonde hair going grey. Near him, business like Brenda, the commander. He smiled. Their daughter Leanne near them, of course. She'd wake laughing. She'd love this. I'll pause at this point. I am not very good at reading. Um out loud. Uh, it's not something I've had any practice with, so we'll have to forgive the text, my poor interpretation. Uh, the imaginary spaceship took form. He turned the other way, and there was Jennifer, cool blonde lover. Careful, though. She'd be zipped in a body in a bag, tidy. She would, too. Science officer, obviously. He smiled in the dark as he added Spock ears and upswept eyebrows. Discomfort intruded. He was actually curled back to back against Karen. It was still full dark outside. He sighed, snuggled in and tried to drift off, drift off again. Karen murmured something in her sleep. 
He listened, but none of it made sense this time. And he really had to pee, stupid body. Carefully, he got himself off the bed. She stayed asleep. Pleased with himself, he left their room. Um, Another side point. Yes, I'm not great at uh, reading this aloud. and I stumble over word structure and whatnot, but so do readers, even when they're reading in their head. So um, many of my errors may mimic stumbling points for, for readers, and it's nice to make things easy for them. The house was quiet. He padded along the open hall to the bathroom, moving faster as nature's call grew more urgent. He battered the door to close it, but not hard enough. Oh well, no time. He did his business, reciting a needle point over the toilet, cleaned up, and got a sip of water from the faucet. He turned towards the door when it hit him. He turned back to the sink. What? He could see every detail of the faucet. Now he realised in a rush that he'd seen the hall below, below the rail outside the door, the far side of the second floor hall, in here, the toilet as he used it. Over it, he'd read his mum's mom's uh, framed needle point. To know how sweet your home may be, just go away, but keep the key. And as he often did when he read it, he added, Hi, Mom, miss you. This time, he realised, he'd finally noticed that one, sti one missed stitch. She apologised for it when he'd opened it, so like her. Everything was sharp. His image was clear in the mirror, lit by the dim nightlight. Did he leave his contacts in? No. There was the overnight container. And this was better. He frowned at the light behind the antique Star Wars night lamp and blinked at a minor distortion of some kind. Okay, not that perfect. He reached for the door, froze, tried to wrap his brain around. Without sensation, his hand was in the door, and he became aware of his own short, sharp breaths and made himself stop that. But the slow breath came in through his teeth. He waved his hand. He felt nothing. It was as if the door didn't exist, or he didn't. Was he dead? He eyed Mira Denny. He was losing his mind. So, um, my poor performance uh, to one side, was that a great first page? Did you understand it? Would it make you turn the page and hurry on into the next? So we're going to scroll into my critiques, which I will read and um, elaborate on as, as it occurs to me. Um, so I've said that that um, first sentence isn't really a great hook. Someone is waking up gently. Um, by line three, we learn that the allusions to space may be closer to the truth. This might be a spaceship. Um, intentional is a, a strange word to have there. And if it's an important one, uh, we should get the answer soon. Uh, then that would be good. Otherwise, um, it shouldn't really be there. But the, the main point is that, um, yes, the modern reader isn't so um, flighty and short of attention span that if your first line isn't brilliant, they're just going to dump you. But they're heading in that direction, you know, in the 50s uh, or 1894, you could write a very slow book and people just sort of tucked in and they were here for the ride, you know, they invested sort of their life savings in a book. There weren't many to choose from. They would sit down and see what you had to say and give you a, a good chance. Uh, that space that you have uh, in order to uh, command the reader's attention has become shorter and shorter. People have many diversions. They've always got something else calling for their time, something uh, even if it's it's leisure, they have many options, um, many of which are easier to consume. So if you let them wander off, they generally will. Um, and OK, maybe you don't have to do it in the first line, but you really probably have to do most of it in the first page. And there's very few readers these days who are just going to plow on for like five chapters in the hope that it's it's going to get good, especially as many of the readers will come to you having uh, maybe read a sample on, on Amazon. Uh, and so you would have liked to have snagged their interest um, in fairly short order um, and hopefully um, made them commit to the book. So what have I said next? So immediately after this fairly complicated um, first line that, that is um, saying nothing exciting, it, it doesn't surprise, it, there's no great surprise there, there's no um, questions raised. Um, 
yeah you could say it raises the question of what the setting is but that's always the question you come with you you want to give the reader some extra questions you want to um uh set something up uh so you, you don't start with the weather you don't start it's a dark and stormy night you don't say it was raining um you say something interesting um and i'm not convinced that this is is that um and then immediately after that we start with uh what's basically a roll call where we're working through a great big list of different characters who are essentially name tags um and then throwing in a few adjectives for each of them so that um we we hear that uh, Leanne is um, and Karen Aaron Leanne. So we've got some some hair color for some of them. We've got some um, Aaron is lanky and going gray. Uh, again, this is not really what we want on a first page. We don't want uh, to start spreading the net and having loads of different characters. We want to focus in or, or produce one or two characters and make them interesting. Make us have some reason to be interested and being lanky or having gray hair isn't uh yeah i'm not saying don't put any color in i'm not saying don't ever describe anyone but this is vital space um and this is probably not the best way to uh to spend it um and, and we're going through a, a whole bunch of characters who are sleeping so they're basically they're, they're furniture at this point um you may as well be describing the the couches and, and the bookcases they don't do anything they just lie there we don't learn anything more about them. Um, yeah, maybe page two, page three we do, but maybe we could just have them introduced um, as we need them. And I don't mean just they've been there all along and we suddenly pop them out when we need them, but that you could start in a way, in a place that doesn't have everyone right there requiring an introduction. So I've said uh, writers often feel they, feel they need to set the scene, but what you really need is to give me a reason to keep reading. You need to just keep on rolling that reason keep on building things have a situation that is in itself intrinsically exciting it doesn't have to be even connected to the the main story um, but something some action and some dialogue are the best ingredients um, keep it simple action dialogue uh, interesting writing um, and then immediately we're introduced to the idea that uh, this spaceship that we thought we're in um, might not even be a spaceship it might all be um, imaginary um, we he's done a lot of description about the, the setting but you know if it's dark how is he seeing these people were those descriptions just from memory um, and the Spock thing you know that where he's just saying or oh, making sort of a joke about eyebrows and, and pointy ears that that's potentially interesting that's uh, potentially a hook uh, it's, it's a pop culture reference uh, I'm okay with that. Um, more of that sort of thing, if, if any necessary. Oh, sorry, if anything. Um, and then we we push on, and we're still, you know, we're coming to the conclusion maybe all of this spaceship stuff was, and even the people themselves was a dream. And generally speaking, read, readers hate dreams. Um, some readers hate flashbacks, and flashbacks are in quotes real. They just happened in book time before the, the current. Some readers aren't even prepared to tolerate with that. So dreams are not interesting. Uh, kids learn early on not to, and this makes me sound like a terrible person, but we're even with a tolerant father who who says, yes, that's, that's interesting. Kids learn early on not to rush in and describe their dreams in great detail because uh, we all discover in the end that nobody really cares um they're not real they're not well structured they're not that interesting so unless your dream was um something of epic proportions then you generally don't spend time telling people about the dream you just had um in books it's even worse you know and, and on page one uh yes don't do it never put dreams into into a story unless they are um at a point where your characters, where your readers have already bought into the whole thing and the dream, dream has a some sort of significant message to deliver that, that um, works. And even then, you know, be uh, judicious with your application. I, I think there's um, uh, a, a dream sequence in Prince of Thorns, but it's not on page one and 
it does serve a purpose and, and um, act in a way like a, a flashback. Okay, so let's move on. We he's he's walking through the house, and we get a, a lot of um, mechanical description about you know using toilets and turning taps on and turning them off, and does the door bounce back and hit him in the ass? This is page one. I can walk away. I really don't need to uh, be reading about sipping water from the from the tap at night time. What's the story? Interest me. Hook me push on and then there's, there's something weird that goes on with with his eyesight and, and the level of detail that he's um able to see but i didn't really get what what the point of it was or what was going on um you know maybe some, this is some sort of hallucination and, and he's um deducing that but it's it's really not very clear and clarity is important uh, um clarity is important everywhere but um on page one you try to ground people give something give them something to hold on to not not less not least hold on to that holds on to them and this is all um a, a bit vague uh and confusing um and now he's reading the needle point above the toilet um and i am saying uh oh so you know he's already looked at it so now this is kind of a flashback why weren't we told that it about what he noticed when he was looking. Um, you know, flashbacks are fine, but in general, uh, try to give things as they happen. Um, if you're in the character's head, then report the stuff that's important when it when it's seen. Um, and yeah, this is just me struggling with the uh, what's going on here. It, it seems like the only thing we're being told in quite considerable detail is that his eyesight seems to be a bit better than it normally is. Um, and we end up with uh, this um, realization that uh, either he's a ghost or the, uh, the, the scene is an illusion. Um, and we could be anywhere, you know, he could be dreaming. This could be some sort of um, hollow deck on a, on a spaceship. We, we really don't know where we are, how much trust of any of it. Um, so, and I then proceed to, to sort of uh, summarize this and, and say that uh, the thing is a, a bit all over the place. Um, it's not really presenting us with, with concrete important questions that feel important. Um, there's, yeah, there, I'm saying there's really no um, internal dialogue going on here. Uh, if you're in a point of view, then um, make use of it and have the character notice things and comment on them. One of the, the keys to bring a point of view to life is to have the um, character anticipate, speculate, and desire things. Um, I think some famous writer said you should always have every character want something, even if um, they're a very minor character, and even if it's only a glass of water. Okay, here he did want a glass of water, um, but he is the major character on page one. Um, you know, with, with the needle point, there is uh, the possibility of emotion, there are questions about what happened to his mother, there were loads of places to go with this, but he didn't really go anywhere um, with it. Um, and I'm saying it's setting, this is true of, of all description as far as I'm concerned, and setting is just description. Um, generally speaking, you do not want to deliver description in big fat chunks uh there's places for all sorts of different writing and sometimes you will um you know the character will just see something study it take it all in and, and you should then write it as a big fat chunk um list descriptions have their place you know sometimes you will see a person and or a thing and you can describe it as a whole list of different attributes and adjectives but generally speaking you should try and slide in the description which includes the setting um, here and there as painlessly as possible, because generally speaking, especially when the reader hasn't really bought into the story yet, they don't want to put the effort in or be basically bored by having you describe a bunch of stuff. So, you know, you could describe the most magnificent castle or dungeon or whatever, but I'm just starting the story. I don't really care. And I know what castles and dungeons are like. So why describe it to me? Um, but if you just put a, a line slither of it here and there in between things happening, 
and let that image that that um, place build up in in the reader's mind as they go without ever feeling that they've been force fed it that is the uh efficient and good way i feel of um setting a scene and then i've harped on here uh which is i guess the main point that you need a problem uh of some form or description for the character um in a book and it's good to have that problem or just a problem it may not be even to be the main one it's just a sometimes you will open a book and you might put your character in some sort of jeopardy or action and it's simply to exercise the character and to let the reader see what sort of person they're dealing with under a bit of stress um you know rather than just have them make a cup of coffee or, or walk to the bathroom and, and try and deduce it there let's have something at stake even though you know maybe the, the overarching story is of the fall of a kingdom or whatever and you open with them running away from having stolen something or running after a thief but you know you get a sense of action and importance and urgency um uh so you a problem is something good um and there i referenced this um advice here that um i think came from some famous um uh, thriller writer was saying you know uh, whenever the uh the, a book starts to flag just have two men kick the door down and start shooting guns everywhere you don't have to do that that that's he, he didn't mean it literally and you shouldn't take it literally but um you should have something of that nature and obviously everything is scaled by the type of book you're writing so if you're writing a comedy of manners then your your problems and tension aren't going to be of the violent sort but they they will be problems and tension in the context of the book someone's going to get embarrassed you know um the carpet it has coffee on it and, and there's going to be trouble something of that nature uh, and in in a book like this you know, if it is set in space, you know, maybe there's an air leak, maybe there's proximity alarm going off, something, something that uh, grabs the, the reader and thinks, oh, how is this going to be resolved? How are they going to get out of this? What does this mean? What's coming? Um, so um, what have I done? I've, I've just slapped down a, a couple of um, possible line ones as an alternative to the one that that would actually in this book um, uh, these are uh, a bit more punchy and reference what's coming up um, i'm not saying they're great i'm just saying like this is you know the ballpark i would be aiming for if, if it were mine um, so i've said it, it wasn't until denny found he couldn't touch anything that he realized he was losing his mind um, or denny was on the toilet when he first realized that he was dead an epiphany of sorts he stopped peeing mid-flow something that is a bit more punchy um, and both of those first lines um, open up a bunch of questions they make you say um, this is an unusual situation this is a situation with possibilities and questions and i want to read more and i've um, finished with this, the thing i should say now which is of course that these are just my thoughts if you gave it to a different writer then you would probably get a, a very different array um and the job of the uh the writer receiving a, a critique is not to worry about it too much but simply to look at it and say am i going to discard all of this or are there elements here that speak to me and i can see their use in my writing and i'll use them um i spent a lot of time in critique groups uh, when i was uh, learning to write online ones and uh, I used to say that the uh, the thing a writer needs is um, skin that is sufficiently thick that they will not um, be cut by all the criticism that's being thrown at them they won't just sort of say oh no uh, I'm, I'm a useless terrible writer I should just stop this immediately and, and walk away uh, but they need skin that is also sufficiently thin that some important elements of what's being said to them can penetrate, be absorbed, and become useful in, in future writing. Uh, so it's that um, finding that balance between uh, not just shedding all criticism like water off a duck's back, because then you'll never benefit from it, but not taking it, it to heart too much, because 
this writing, this this page one, this book is is yours. It's your unique vision, and good books aren't written by committee. Um, it's very unlikely that everything I've said to anyone about any one piece of writing is on on the money uh, for them. So it, they should pick and choose which bits they want. So that's my first um, dive into uh, critiquing online and uh, doing YouTube videos. Hopefully the fan in the background um, wasn't too annoying, but without it, I would probably be even more of a sweaty heap than I am already. So now I will ungainly um, hunt for the button that will stop this recording and click it. Goodbye all.